church. Well, uh, this is a kind of a conclusion to what we started last week. And uh, probably the best preaching coach I've ever had, his name's Sabrina. <laughs> and uh, she uh, <clears throat> on occasion says, now, and, and by the way, she didn't do this this week, but she, <laughs> she on occasion says, now don't go back and re-preach what you did um, last Sunday. So I... Uh, <clears throat> I'm going to heed my preaching coach's advice and not re-preach what I did last Sunday. But um, I am going to just say, refer to this slide for just a second, and say that we, <clears throat> we have been talking about uh, the idea of idolatry out of Colossians chapter 3, where in verse 5, Paul says, Put to death, therefore, uh, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires and greed, which is idolatry. And I, I've i struggled a little bit with a question of, is it just greed that's idolatry in this piece of Scripture, or does each one of these things that Paul mentions here, uh, lust and uh, uh, sexual immorality and those things, are, are they all different types of idolatry? And, and it really doesn't, I don't think, matter too much because the principle that's being discussed here is that... Uh, idolatry wears a lot of different faces. And uh, so to just try to establish kind of a theology around idolatry, you know, we looked at this passage in Colossians 3, and then uh, we looked at this idea in Jeremiah 2 that uh, uh, where, where basically God says to Israel, because you are in the process of trying to build treaties and make covenants with surrounding nations to protect you, God basically calls that idolatry. Now, my question is, why would that be idolatry? And the answer to the question is, because God wants to be Israel's Savior. So, anything that we put in a place um, as our Savior that, that isn't uh, Jehovah, that's idolatry. Um, that's not the only thing, though, and, and greed and some of these other things are... So one of the other items that we put on the table last week was this idea that anything that we elevate to a supreme place in our life, uh, no matter how nice or how good that thing is, um, that becomes an, an idol. So um, we, we talked a, a lot about that. If, Eventually, that'll be up on the web, and you guys can get that if you didn't get it last week. Um, so we were on this uh, practical app screen uh, last week, and so that's where we're going to pick up <clears throat> this week. Um, I referenced Romans chapter 1, which I'm not going to do that in detail right now, but if you want to, you can go back and uh, do your study in Romans 1. And the, the whole... The whole context of Romans 1, beginning with verse 18 and going all the way through the end of the chapter, uh, kind of revolves around man's idolatrous heart and our willingness to pursue God's creation as opposed to pursuing God. In fact, Paul talks about that consistently. You want God's stuff, but you don't want God. Or you want what God can give you, but you don't want God. And uh, I think that there are a lot of people in the church who are going to be sorely... Um, surprised at the uh, judgment day because I think they think that there's going to be a significant reward um, that transcends uh, Jehovah. But at the end of this thing, Jehovah is the reward. So, I mean, that's what you get out of this. You get a relationship with Him. You say, well, I, that's cool, but I want that and some other stuff too. And the truth of the matter is you got a rude awakening coming because uh, there there isn't anything other than Jehovah. There isn't anything other than Jesus. So Jesus is, uh, Jesus is it. That's what you get. Um, and uh, so much of what goes on in churches nowadays is uh, kind of warmed over psychology 101. It's... Um, Here's uh, five things that you need to do to be a better husband. And my problem with that is 
that uh, you know we skip from you know Romans to Ephesians and and we you know put together this list of the five things that you need to do to be a better husband, <clears throat> which the scriptures never say. I mean, it, in no place in the Bible does the Bible say, and here's the five things that you need to do to be a, a better husband. What do you need to do to be a better husband? You need to sacrificially love Jesus and sacrificially love your wife. Now, that I can tell you, but, but the truth is, the, the way that works is the closer you get to Jesus, the more sacrificially you're going to love your wife. The more... Uh, you get to close the closer you get to Jesus, the more sacrificially you're going to love your husband. So, uh, how how do you become a better husband, or how do you become a better wife? You draw near to Jesus, and um, and what He may tell you to do may may not be written down specifically in this piece of scripture. That's part of the problem with uh, bibliolatry, which is what. It's the bibliolatry is the worship of the Bible. Is it possible for us to worship the Bible? Yes. Yeah. Is the Bible the answer to our problem? No. The Bible points us to the answer to our problem. So, uh, and I'm kind of getting ahead of myself, but if we put the Bible up on a pedestal and we bow down and worship the Bible... Um, or if we put the Bible up on a pedestal and we bow down to worship our knowledge of the Bible, that is, in a very real sense, not, let me rephrase, I'm going to take out a very real sense, that is idolatry. That is putting something in the ultimate position as our Savior um, that isn't God. The Bible can't save you. I know a lot of people who know a lot of Bible who are as lost as they are, you know, alive. And so, I wanted to just throw out uh, th three basic categories of uh, idolatry. Um, I'm not going to spend an awful lot of time on the first one. I think most of us understand how this works, but money can become an idol uh, in our personal lives. Um, I think romance, you know, um, we have listened to Hollywood for so long. And it's not just Hollywood. I mean, a long time before there was a Hollywood, there were uh, stories about uh, prince and princess. And, um, and at the end of the book, when you open up that last page and there's the sunset and, you know, and the birds are singing and, and it says, and they what? lived happily ever after. Yeah. And the reason that they lived happily ever after is because uh, she loves him and he loves her and, and it's just, uh, just so sweet. But the, the problem with that is uh, it's well, let me back up and say, you know, it's, it's kind of that Jerry Maguire. Everybody, everybody can quote this. Um, and, and I was thinking about this the other day when I was putting this sermon together. <coughs> Um, you know, what is it about a catchphrase in a particular movie that makes it stick and makes people hold on to it? And, and uh, I, I suspect that if I were to say, Jerry Maguire, and then have you tell me what I'm thinking, almost every one of you in here can tell me the, the phrase in that movie where Jerry Maguire, one, one of two of them, one of two phrases, one of them where he said, you had me at hello... And the other one is what? Show me the money. Not show me the money. You, you, com <coughs> you complete me, right? Yeah, show me the money. Thanks. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so there's this, there's this mentality that, and it's a, it's a Hollywood thing. And in fact, I, I heard a guy uh, several weeks ago was talking about. Uh, the fact that pretty much every Hollywood love story has exactly the same plot. It's just, you know, a little bit different actors and there's, you know, they're kind of in different, uh, kind of in a different environment. But, but basically, you know, boy loves girl, uh, girl loves boy, uh, something happens and they break up. Uh, it looks like it's not going to work. And then at the end, it does work. You know, that's, that's kind of the story. And, uh, 
Uh, but there's this mentality that if, if I can just find that perfect person, then everything will be okay in my life. And uh, the truth of the matter is, um, where that leads is just plain, simple idolatry, where we worship um, another individual as opposed to uh, worshiping uh, Jehovah. And marriages on occasion uh, come apart. And I, I, I think that if people are focused on Jesus, it's less likely that that's going to happen. But even in marriages where people are focused on Jesus, uh, those things come apart on occasion. And when that happens, um, it's extremely difficult if your God has been that other individual. It's, it's always difficult to pick up and move on, but it is almost impossible to pick up and move on if your God has been that other individual. So, uh, other people, romance in general, um, family. I, I just touched on this last week, you know, the brat picture there, and um, the way we create brats, I think, is we wind up worshiping our kids. And... Um, and they grow up to just be monsters, and um, I, I and and it's e it's easy, especially when kids are young and cute and cuddly. It's easy to uh, put them on a pedestal. The problem is, if I put that little one on a pedestal and make an ultimate thing out of that little one, um, uh, that little one's going to grow up to be. Uh, a very difficult person to live with eventually. And, uh, you know, you see it. I, I was, of course, I can do this all day long, but I mean, uh, we watched it with uh, our daughters in gymnastics, and we watched it with uh, Caleb when he was playing baseball uh, and soccer, for that matter. I just uh, am appalled at the way that parents act at... Um, at sporting events. I just I am amazed at how incredibly important uh, that kid's performance on the uh, baseball diamond is. And, and I understand. I wanted Caleb to succeed. I wanted him to do well. But I wasn't laboring under the delusion that it was likely he was going to play pro ball, you know. And um, so I just wanted him to learn, you know, how to take a defeat, how to win without being arrogant, how to work as a team. I mean, those were kind of the things that I was looking for. So, uh, so there are religious idols, uh, and I think one of the most demonic things, and I'm just going to focus on this for a few minutes, and then we're going to be done pretty much, but uh, one of the most demonic things in our culture is how easy it is for... Um, our religious activity to create I idols. Um, I think that, <clears throat> you know, as money worshipers think that they're just hardworking people. You know what I'm saying? I mean, you've ever been around a, a guy who's, who it's easy to see from your point of view that the only thing that matters in his life is money. But he thinks that he's just, just a hard-working guy. And um, I think family worshipers often think that they're just loving their family. Those who worship religious idols think that they're devoted to God. But um, there's a problem. So I want to just list the four idols real quickly uh, that I think apply to the, to the churches of Christ, at least. And the first one is the idea of truth. Um, in the Old Testament specifically, there's this individual that's listed regularly, and he's called the scoffer. Have you guys uh, seen that individual? Uh, have you? You guys are looking at me kind of weird. Uh, I think the uh, NIV calls him the mocker. But if the, the question is, what, does, what, what is that scoffer? Uh, individual that we're talking about in the Old Testament. And if you look at the definition in, 
in uh, Psalms and several other places, pro- Proverbs. Um, there are several things that characterize this guy. He thinks that he's right, and he is constantly w- walking around um, scoffing at people who don't agree with him. You, you guys know who I'm talking about? Um, now, I'm, I'm not suggesting that it's a bad thing for us to, you know, on occasion um, be a little sarcastic. Does, does Paul ever be sarcastic? Yeah. Do the Old Testament prophets, uh, were they ever sarcastic? Sure. But if, if your mentality is constantly running down other people because they don't agree with you, if, if your uh, mentality is constantly, we were talking about throwing the flag in our Bible class this morning, um, anybody who's ever been around a guy who is constantly correcting other people's theology... My suspicion is that that guy's idol isn't God. I think that guy's idol is what? Truth. Now, I think we need to pursue truth. But when the New Testament talks about truth, it's not talking about... And guys, I'm, I'm going to say this very plainly because I think it is absolutely critical that, that uh, you hear this. When the New Testament talks about truth, aletheia... It's not talking about whether we sing the correct way or not, or whether we are allowed to have a um, kitchen in our church building, or um, you know whatever. Um, whether we can clap, you know, it's 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 funny in this group because there's a couple of songs that Jim leads that there's a little, you know. Uh, in the, in the song, and and we are so unsure of whether it's okay to just clap because and here's why we're unsure because we've been told by people on uh, numerous occasions that it's you know you're not allowed to clap during church services. Now my question would be where would you find that passage of scripture that says thou shalt not clap in church. Um, it's in First Opinions, uh, chapter three, I think. So, this per- this pursuit of truth, in a doctrinal sense, is what most people think of when we talk about truth. But the New Testament says, "You shall know the truth, and the truth will set you free." And if you look at the context of that, by the way, the word know is you will have a relationship with. It's not know like I know what 2 plus 2 is. It's know like I have a relationship with Sabrina or I have a relationship with Rachel. It's, there's a, an intimate knowledge that I have with those individuals. And so when that, when that statement is made, you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free, the idea there is that not that you will know a bunch of facts, which is what we've typically said, but that you will know what? Jesus. Jesus. I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. And so, do I think that there are doctrinal issues that are important? Absolutely, I do. But I think the most important thing is, and we were talking about this in our Bible class this morning, does does Ralph have a relationship with Jesus? Now, I believe that if Ralph has a relationship with Jesus, that uh, if Ralph has missed something along the way, and he's, he's genuinely in love with Jesus, and has placed Jesus in that place of ultimate in his life, I just believe with all of my heart that Jesus is capable of correcting Ralph's Uh, theological problems. I I just think he is. Um, Let me say that another way. I don't think that Jesus needs my help (laughs) in that particular situation. Uh, Now, certainly if, and we we said this in our Bible class this morning, but I want to reiterate, certainly if, you know, if somebody says to me, well, what do you think? Do you think I should do this or do you think I shouldn't do... I mean, if I'm invited in, I don't have a problem uh, sitting down and saying, well, I'll tell you what I think. But the idea that I feel the need to correct the theological uh, 
problems in the lives of, of uh, Travis is, is there, there are several problems with that and one of them is that if I go back and look at where I was 25 years ago in my theology and where I am now uh, I, I've I've changed a lot since then and so all of the help that I gave back 25 years ago I'd like to go back and undo <laughs> you know or, or some of it anyway so you know it's I, I'm, I'm glad to sit down with, with a brother and help that brother f if he's struggling with you know how do I deal with this or, or whatever but I am less and less uh, interested in running around trying to uh, bring you up to my level because the truth of the matter is uh, I'm beginning to realize uh, if I here's another problem with this if I bring you up to my level uh, there there's a ceiling there and and my level is uh, way beneath the level of what's his name um, oh yeah Jesus so you know if I bring you up to my level then the, the problem is you know I can only carry you so far but if I point you to Jesus uh, it may be you bringing me up you know five years from now so truth is uh, an easy thing for us to place in the ultimate position and, and I, I'm okay with that as long as we understand the definition of truth Jesus being truth um, but the idea that we are we are truth and you come to us is uh, problematic. I mean, uh, there, there's a lot of problems with that. I'm just going to touch on this deal about gifts. Um, when I say gifts, I, I mean talents. Um, I think it's easy and I think it's extremely detrimental for the church to... Um, to place in an ultimate position people who have uh, specific skills like the ability to speak uh, publicly. I know a lot of guys who can speak publicly who have no idea what it means to walk with Jesus. So just saying, and, and, and the truth of the matter is there have been times in John Dennis's life where I was not walking with the Christ. I was just up here uh, talking. And you say, well, that offends me. Well, I mean, I'm just going to be honest. Uh, just because a guy can speak well publicly means absolutely nothing if he doesn't have a relationship with the truth, right? So, um, and I think the damage that we've done to the church is that we've made people think that uh, there are certain people who are more important to the church than other people. Uh, the folks who can speak well, the folks who can sing well, those folks are important, but the folks who, um, you know, might struggle a little bit when they stand in front of the group, well, you know, they're, they're kind of second, second tier Christians. And, uh, you know, their mansion that, you know, that they're going to get when they get over there is probably going to have, uh, uh, you know, laminate, you know, on the floor instead of, you know, wood. Um, I think in the churches of Christ we've struggled with this idea that morality is uh, kind of the goal and I'm here to tell you morality is not the goal do I think you're going to be moral as the closer you draw to Jesus certainly but uh, uh, the problem with morality being the goal is that um, Anybody in here ever gotten up and felt just strong and moving along like uh, nobody's business and then all of a sudden uh, somewhere about midway through the day Satan finds your Achilles heel and you just... I mean, is that, am I the only one that's ever had that happen? We have a culture, by the way, who has pretty much embraced this idea that morality is the final... Uh, chapter of you know the the human endeavor and it, and it basically goes like this well I, I mean I don't cheat on my wife and I pay my taxes and you know I I've been good with my kids and you know I, I've lived a moral life so how could God 
you know, how could God not let me go to heaven? Well, if you're banking on morality to save you, uh, you got problems. Because ultimately what Paul's going to say in Romans chapter 1, well actually chapter 1, 2, and 3 is, that if you're banking on your morality to save you, you are lost. And you're lost because, and your conscience even knows this, Paul will say, you're lost because every single one of us have done things that we know are deserving of death. You say, well, not, I mean, not me. Give it a break. You've done things that you know are really, really immoral. And as I mentioned this morning in Bible class, if you aren't to that place, then your problem is what? Arrogance. There you go. So, and then lastly, I think of religious idols, uh, one of the ones that uh, we often find is we place the church uh, in this position of uh, supremacy. And um, so I'm just going to say it this way, and then I'm going to move on. Uh, you don't come into the church, and that gets you saved. God saves you, and then He, what? Adds you to the church. Adds you to the church. The church, and by the way, I didn't say that. I mean, that's all over the book of Acts. Um, so, so here's the deal. The, the, the church of Christ, um, and, and I, love, I love the church. So I, I'm not throwing rocks at, at uh, and, but, but I need to say this. <laughs> I'm going to say it this way. Christ's church. Uh, when I say the Church of Christ, we think of a group of people with a specific sign out front. And, and I, I'm not interested in going there. I'm just interested in looking at this from my universal point of view. There is a group of people that Jesus has saved. That He has added uh, folks to. And He's the one who gets to make that decision. Whether Ralph's in or whether Ralph's out. And uh, so... You've got this group of people, the saved, that the New Testament calls the church. But it's imperative that you understand that the church doesn't, what, save you. Um, the church cannot save you. In fact, um, on occasion, the church will throw um, all sorts of roadblocks in your way. Because the church is what? People. And uh, people are... People are messy. Well, real quickly, and I, I don't think I'm talking to people in this room that, that typically have a problem with these last three, but fr from a cultural point of view... I think we tend to idolize human reason, uh, especially in the United States. Uh, it is an ongoing, regular conversation that if, if we could just uh, educate people correctly, then all of our problems would go away. Uh, if you don't believe that that's what we think, read some of the uh, more prominent writers of our age, like H.G. Wells, for instance. Most of you know H.G. Wells because he wrote uh, science fiction stuff, but he also, H.G. Wells also wrote several books about um, if we could just educate people enough, uh, then all of these problems would go away. And H.G. Wells was not a believer in Jesus, obviously. And at the end of his life, H.G. Wells wrote a piece um, and I re, I'm having trouble recalling the name of it, but basically it was um, an intellect an intellect unmoored from its moorings or something like that. And basically it was, I don't understand, we've got all this technology and we've, we've applied all of the intellect and, and, uh, and still we've, you know, we've got all these problems. And it's, it's not working. And uh, the reason it's not working is because intellect is actually the problem and not the solution. Um, and then I think science and technology kind of fall along in those same um, in that same category. So, <clears throat> last slide, real quick. 
So how do we make money just money? How do we uh, make beauty just beauty? There's nothing wrong with being pretty. There's uh, nothing wrong with having money. The problem is, and there's so many reasons why this is the case. Probably the most important reason is that the problem with beauty is what? It doesn't doesn't last. I mean, it it uh, it fades, and that's just um, the nature of the beast. Look at Hollywood. The uh, the folks that are that were pretty and were on top of the uh, uh, pay scale uh, five years ago aren't on top of the pay scale anymore. And uh, you know, I, I see um, uh, I see some of these actors that I, I remember thinking, you know, of, and it doesn't seem like it was that many years ago. Remember Han Solo? You know, I mean, wow, what a what a hero, you know, or Indiana Jones? I mean, uh, that guy. When I grow up, I want to be like that guy. Now you look at that guy, and uh, I, you know I I said something to Sabrina the other day about man, he's old. <laughs> well, uh, yeah, that's what happens. Um, uh, you know, there's there are two movies right now. I'm not uh, even going to call the names of the movies, but uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger and uh, uh, Sylvester Stallone have both got movies out with them in an action uh, you know hero role and and I'm I'm thinking to myself uh, seriously <laughs> I mean <laughs> at, you know at 60 it's probably time to you know go to with a more intellectual kind of a thing you know uh, the, the reason being that beauty fades the reason that money doesn't make a good God is because what uh, sometimes presidents that are are elected that okay no I won't go there because <laughs> um, this will be on the web. Uh, here's the reason that money doesn't make a good god because uh, one day you're wealthy and the next day you may not be. And uh, the only god in the universe that will just stay with you is the one the Old Testament calls Yahweh and the New Testament calls Yeshua, Jesus. So stop dabbling in discipleship and put uh, all your eggs in that relationship basket with Him. Um, I've got this on the screen because, um, and they don't do this anymore, but I, I always remember uh, they would show Cocoa Puffs on an advertisement or another cereal just like it. Uh, they would show Cocoa Puffs on an ad, and uh, then they would show a banana and uh, several other things, you know, in the picture. And then it would say, Cocoa Puffs, part of this, what? Well-rounded breakfast. And uh, typically when I would see that, I would think, well, if you remove the Cocoa Puffs, you'd actually have a, you know, a better breakfast than if, you know, you, you know, if you put the Cocoa Puffs in the picture. So, so many of us Christians have this mentality that, you know, God's just kind of part of uh, our well-rounded life. He doesn't want to be part of your well-rounded life. He wants to be what? Your life. That's right. And if He's just part of your well-rounded life, then you've got an idolatry problem. So... Uh, we'll end there. Jim, come lead us in the invitation song.